opening doors. What am I going to do for this? Opening digital doors. in the Mediterranean, trying to hold my breath. How does that relate to social mm. media? So I like using social media because it's uh, a tool that opens doors very quickly and uh, very effectively. So I can communicate with people around the world. I can communicate with groups of, in my case, digital librarians uh, across Europe and get back interesting information on that particular subject. I can communicate to a whole group on augmented reality and virtuality and uh, digital art, and I can send out a question to them or pose an, uh, a query and get back replies from that particular group on Twitter. So that's great. Um, and in terms of my own personal use, if you look at um, an example here, if I start this, this is um, swimming out on the Mediterranean, um, swimming towards a, a black hole in, in the side of a cliff face underwater. And it's because Facebook, years ago, showed me, because it knows I have an interest in swimming underwater, that I could learn to do a course and learn to hold my breath. Wow. That's spectacular. Is that like when G's? Yeah, amazing. I'm going to go to the car. So, because I've been used in social media, I've changed the sports and activities I do. It's changed the way or the places that I visit um, when I go on trips. Although that's more slightly more difficult in the current climate. But social media, used correctly, has got fantastic opportunities for you. It's important that you have a good social media presence. You use it appropriately. You use a rule of thumb where you say, if I'm worried about sending out a post, um, if, I'm, if I'm hesitating, if I'm going to hesitate about sending out a post, don't do it. When you're thinking about the future, it's very important to consider what's happened in the past. And if we go back uh, about 50 years, this is the equivalent to an MP3 player from the early 1970s. And this one, in fact, was um, owned by an ex-Vietnam vet, and he used it to uh, record his messages to send back to his family. So at the same time that this uh, MP3 player existed, so to speak, the Apollo 11 was going to the moon, and it had an onboard computer for its navigation systems. And that computer consisted of about 4K. It occupied a space of about just under half a square meter. So, um, if you'd like to think, how big would your phone be if it was using the technology from 50 years ago that put man on the moon? Would it be... This big? You might choose to have a ponder on that. We've just been talking about how computers have become much, much smaller over time, and I'm going to be talking about that just reveal a little bit more in a moment. Uh, but they've also become incredibly faster. Um, and the other factor that so kind of coincides with this is the rate at which computers can talk to each other, sort of the network and the, in the interconnectivity between computers. And there's this term called Internet of Things, or IoT, which is the term that's used that uh, refers to how devices, small devices, talk to each other.
and how there's an awful lot of power and potential for that type of technology to be able to do an awful lot more without going into specifics. So here we have got a little chart of uh, uh, communication rates. So years ago, decades ago, I would have been sitting at my desktop and um, the download speed from the internet would have been something like 9,600 board rate. That's 9,600 bits of data per second. That's a very small amount. That means I would have sat at my machine for, I don't know, nearly 25 minutes, half an hour or so to download a megabyte of data. Um, laborious. 3G. Uh, everyone's got a 3G phone or a 3G enabled phone. Um, and you're talking about 384,000 bits of data to your phone per second. Everyone, if you buy, a, if you bought a smartphone in the last, um, however long it was, eight years or so, 4G has been around. We've look, we're looking at uh, bits per second in the range of 100 million bits per second. Beyond that, 5G. Some of you will have 5G phones, and if you're lucky enough, you've also got 5 5G um, mask near you as well to make use of it. Um, in which case, you're lucky because then you are accessing speeds or in the order of 10 billion bits per second to your phone. 10 billion bits per second to your mobile phone. 10 billion bits of data to your phone in a second. Most people think that uh, your data contract is great. You can receive uh, information a lot quicker. Your WhatsApp's going to work faster. The way you can see files will be faster. The games you can play are going to be more interesting and, and uh, more expansive. The important thing to, to consider with the amount of data that you're receiving is how it's going to affect the activities, the way you work, the way you study, the way you connect with people, the way items and pieces of equipment around you work currently and how that will change in the future. What does 10 billion bits of data to your mobile phone mean? And what will it do for the future? And beyond 5G, because inevitably it's going to change, they are already looking at 6G. And the plans for 6G are that uh, it's going to start coming online somewhere around 2025 uh, and possibly be prevalent in uh, 20 or 2030. And all we know at the moment is that 6G will be a multiplier of 5G in terms of its capacity to be able to send information. What can you do with that amount of data when it's streamed to devices all over your house, all over the city, all over the planet? This is the ancient Japanese game of Go. It's about two and a half thousand years old. It predates chess by about a thousand years. And you can see it's a, a 19 by 19 board. On the screen, you can see a, an online game that uh, I was playing just quickly uh, on a small nine by nine board. So you can go online, you can go online this evening uh, and just uh, register and, and play a game, and play games for free with people around the world. It's a really nice game to play. But it, it was used as a benchmark in computer science for trying to find a level at which computers had uh, achieved or got to a particular level. So you'll know that uh, chess computers can beat the world's greatest chess players now. And that was achieved in 1997 with IBM's um, uh, Deep Blue uh, computer program. And, and it was played against Gary Kasparov. But it wasn't until 2017 that a UK company produced a program called AlphaGo. And there's a fantastic film you can just uh, Google and, and find and, and watch about that pro program. Um, and in 2017, they had this program called AlphaGo, which was given the set of rules to play this game. The rules are very simple, very straightforward, but the strategy itself is immensely complex. So if you're a Go player, if you're a world-class Go player, you will immerse yourself in the Go culture, the literature, the uh, wisdom from thousands of years of, of, of people playing Go to be able to be a world-class Go player. So the UK company produced this program uh, called AlphaGo and they gave it the set of rules to, to be able to play Go. And within a day, it had taught itself to beat world-class Go players. With all of these developments in computing, it's not just a case of thinking, well, things are going to get smaller, the, uh, my phone's going to work faster, my uh, gaming console at home is going to be better. It's thinking, what 
are the implications for the way in which you're going to work, for the way in which you're going to live in the future, and for the opportunities you can make of this ever expanding range of technological innovations that are happening now and expanding in the future. What is the potential that you can make of all of those opportunities? Well, I'd like to just remind you at the beginning of uh, what some of the technological innovations are, just for you, just so that you've got something to uh, consider. So even if you don't use computers and you have no interest, you might just stumble across one in Milton Keynes. Here we have a, a little drone delivering parcels from Amazon, um, working its way around uh, pedestrians. So it's a little remote drone working its way through Milton Keynes and trying to avoid pedestrians. Very interesting technology. Well, that's been around in concept for many decades, um, but in more recently it's actually becoming it's actually a real device now. So these are small computers, microscopic computers the size of dust which with their own energy, their own ways of communicating, and all sorts of applications. This slide shows you a small smattering of some of the different types of technologies that are currently out there. Currently out there and some that are still being developed. So I'd like you to just consider looking at the screen, some of the technologies that uh, might you'll be familiar with, and think about how they might be used with the different vocational areas that you are either working in or interested in going in, whether it's medicine or agriculture or retail or farming, whatever. How do some of these technologies relate to those different work areas? Now consider Having pushed all the uh, technologies to the left hand side of the screen, how some of these might impact upon different vocational areas. So let's take um, farming. Um, so I know someone who's a farmer. Um, and uh, how might GPS and so forth be used with, uh, in, a, in the farming agricultural sector? Uh, retail. How will some of these technologies impact upon retail and shopping? Um, how will some of these technologies impact upon um, architecture? Uh, you might be interested in education. If we look at uh, the services, police and so forth, which of these um, technologies are being used with uh, the police with fire and with uh, ambulance. Uh, I can offhand think of um, some virtual reality applications that have been used with the fire uh, services. Uh, we could look at art, uh, sculpture, um, game, gaming. and whatever other industries, areas you are interested in going into, what types of technologies, applications do you see in those areas? And if you're thinking about those, then you might also consider what skills, what digital skills you might need to acquire to make sure that you're maximizing the potential of your opportunities in those different areas. So perhaps <clears throat> if I was a farmer, I know it would be useful for me to be aware of things like a GPS, uh, technologies, the uh, the opportunities to be able to scan my field using the latest in tractor technology so that when I'm driving my tractor across the field it picks up all of the data, soil sampling as it goes. So having just taken my tractor across the field for whatever purpose I end up with a complete digital picture of what my soil substrate is like for um, for my next planning for the crops and so forth. I'd like to just mention an example of some of the stuff I come across um, related to the work that my colleagues do. Um, here is an, just an example. This is a, a group of people wandering around what appears to be a completely um, empty, empty room. It is completely white. 
white floor, white cabinets, white ceiling, white windows. There is nothing in there of any interest at all. Yet these three people appear to be completely engaged. And actually, you can see that they're all wearing virtual reality headsets. That means that they cannot see each other. In fact, they cannot even see the cabinets that they're staring at. They can't see the walls in the room. They can't see the ceiling. They cannot see the floor. They cannot see each other. And they cannot see the door, literally. So effectively, all these three people in this room are completely blind. They're not seeing reality. The guy on the left here is looking down at this cabinet, but he is in fact seeing this little picture on the right. So he's seen, seeing a, a virtual reality representation of some artifacts in a museum. He can see a stone floor beneath his feet and to the left of him, although you can't see it on this screen, he can feel the warmth from a virtual fire. And if he turns around to his left, he will see a fire and he, he can actually feel the heat from it because in actual case, they, in fact, they used a real fire in this room. So these people are wandering around um, a virtual gallery in central London. And this is what they are actually seeing. So they can see little splodges where other people are and they're walking around this virtual room. This is an imagined room created in virtual reality. This is a little argument as to why networking and social media is very important. Down in the bottom left hand corner, I've got um, people like my family who know me very well. They've known me uh, most of my life. Beyond that, I've got uh, friends. And uh, they've known me uh, for a long time. Um, and my interests with them are slightly different from that with my family. So my friends uh, have work in all sorts of different areas, different industries, have different skills. And they're quite interesting to talk to, um, thankfully, because they're my friends. Um, and kind of closely following on on them are work colleagues, people I see when I go to work. Smell that, and then my work colleagues are a little bit up here. They're a more diverse group of people. They're not my chosen friends, but they are an interesting group because their interests are, are a lot more different and diverse from my friends. So I learn a lot about their own interests and their own skills when I, I communicate with my work colleagues. And related to the work I do, I meet uh, people, uh, another group of people I meet just rarely beyond that. And these are people I meet in occasional meetings. They're, they're related to some of the people I work with. Um, they're on the fringes of my own areas. So they're an even more diverse group of people in terms of interests. So on the left hand side here, this is a scale I've got here, common interests. And this group of rarely people that I rarely meet, they might be in business meetings. I've got interests in all sorts of different areas. And if I meet them, I come across and I end up exploring ideas that I'd never thought of at the beginning of the day. Ideas that I never knew existed at the beginning of the day. They're a group of people that will open me up to that. So networking is really important because beyond this group of people here, we've got another group way over here. And these people that I've never ever met and am an, am, and am very unlikely to ever meet. Uh, and this group of people are, in terms of uh, learning stuff and exploring new ideas, are possibly the most interesting group to meet. An example of that is um, using Twitter to communicate with uh, some scientists in a submersible off the west coast of California. So they were using Twitter to communicate to the world uh, for anyone who was interested. So I can have a, a conversation with them using a social media platform. They're people I'm never going to meet, but it was very interesting seeing on video what they were looking at and being able to ask them some questions about some benthic uh, organism on the, on the floor. So social networking allows you to go from just dealing with your colleagues where you're promoting stuff to being able to communicate effectively and interestingly with these other groups and it's these kind of groups here as we go up if I choose a different color as we go up here that give you the opportunities to explore new ideas 
And that's where social media is very important. It takes you away from just dealing with uh, your friends and the people that know you very closely around here. And it opens up opportunities to you that you would not have seen, not have, not have explored if it were not for the value that social media brings. In summary, three tips for opening digital doors. One, develop your skills and keep on developing them. Things will always change, so your skills have got to change and you've got to adapt with everything that happens. So always look to update and carry on learning. Two, network. There are lots of opportunities and things you do not know, you're not aware of. You'll only find those by networking with people on that curve, further away from your friends and family. Three, explore proactively look for areas of interest uh, attend online talks attend online presentations uh, go to online meetings and forums chat with people explore what's out there explore what's happening um, keep ahead of of your subject area and kind of linking with all of that is this little notion that when you come across new challenges someone asks you to do something or you're faced with something that you've not done before you'll often find that um, there's an awful lot of apprehension about doing that uh, and that's completely understandable but kind of see that apprehension as an opportunity so all challenges are really opportunities because on the other side of a challenge you get there very successfully is a sunnier picture and even just working towards the challenge will get you some of the way to acquiring new skills and new opportunities and that's what you need to do